Okay, welcome to the third class of selected topics in biopsychology. In the last uh, class, we were talking about the structural and physiological properties of the neurons. Uh, just a brief uh, summary about this, you know, the neurons actually have uh, very common uh, traits uh, along with the other animal cells or mammalian cells, like they have cell body, inside the cell body there is nucleus, and then there are subcellular structures that are organelles, and uh, of course neurons like other cells have their DNA in the nucleus, which actually drives the gene expression and then producing the required proteins. And the protein repertoire of an individual neuron depends on the type uh, of each neuron. It is not constant, right? And we were talking about the physiological properties of a neuron, and we learned that neurons have a resting state, which is established by the electrochemical gradient of ions across the cell membrane of neurons, right? And then uh, when this uh, actually resting state is uh, distorted by by the innervating neurons and their signals, then the neuron is ready to actually get excited and send the signal to the next neuron. And that is generated by action potentials, right? So now we are going to talk how actually neurons all together combine and form a very complex structure of the brain. Brain anatomy is very complex and it has actually challenged uh, many generations of students, including me. So I hope you will not get scared of it uh, after today. <laughs> and But I think after also in the upcoming seminar classes, you will have time to also practice and I am sure you will get to know our brain better. Why these uh, information regarding the brain structure is important because later when we are going to talk about the mental disorders, I'm going to explain, for example, oh, there is a brain region called hippocampus or limbic system, and then there is something going wrong there, let's say, or there are some overactivation in that circuitry, and then you need to know where does it Locate, where is it located in the brain? That's why you need to know these structures in order to understand the upcoming classes. So first, actually, we will talk about the meninges, the ventricular system. These are more maybe introductory part of the real brain anatomy. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, different uh, anatomical sections of the brain. And uh, these are cro cross-sectional view of the brain, in addition to surface, surface anatomy of the brain. But the surface anatomy has different angles, such as lateral view, dorsal view, or ventral view. So each time the same thing looks very differently depending on the way you look at it. And we will have the chance to review all. So, but my question is now, when you open the skull, what is the first thing you see? So this is our head, right? And then you open the skull, right? Skin, you cut the skin, think that you are a neurosurgeon, you cut the skin, you open the skull, what do you see? What would you see? What do you expect to see? Brain. No, we don't see the brain yet. And that is exactly what I wanted to tell you. Brain is so well protected, even the skull is not enough. Then after the skull, there are different layers of actually uh, membranes. Okay, here in this slide, I can show you. You see the skin of the scalp, and then this is the bone of the skull. And then here, I want you to focus on three important membranes. These are called meninges. The first one is the dura matter. The second one is the arachnoid matter. And the third one is the pia matter. So dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia, pia matter are three important membranes, which are called meninges of the brain. These are encapsulating the brain and protecting the the brain, all right? Protecting and supporting the brain. The another important thing, and that uh, is maybe more essential for you to understand the anatomy of the brain, because a lot of internal brain structures are aligned with this 
ventricular system, which are actually brain cavities. So these are basically the cavities that are filled with specific brain fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And it has a function of, again, protection and facilitation of brain. For example, when the metabolic waste is supposed to be removed, it is uh, happening as a result of the interaction with this fluid. So what are the structures of the ventricular system? Basically, we have two lateral ventricles. This is the one in the first hemisphere because brain has two hemispheres, and each hemisphere usually the structures, at least in the... Uh, uh, if you look at it in general, they are highly symmetrical. So here you have one lateral ventricle and then you have the second lateral, lateral ventricle. And you can consider them as first ventricle, second ventricle, but we usually call them as lateral ventricles. And then you have the third ventricle. So when I was a student, I didn't understand where does this third ventricle come. And actually, because this is the third, this is the second, but we call it like lateral ventricles because they are lateral on the side according to the, this ventricle, which is the third ventricle, all right? So, and then actually these two lateral ventricles uh, are connected to the third ventricle via this small structure here like a pipe, which is called ventricular foramen. And then you have actually here a structure like a canal called cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle. So brain has a ventricular system. Ventricular systems system is like the cavities that are filled with the brain fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid or CSF has a function of supporting the brain, protecting, or nourishment for, it is involved in the nourishment of the brain during the you know, removal of metabolic waste, for example, from the brain tissues. And it is all found in this ventricular system. The largest ventricle is the lateral ventricle in both of the sides, the lateral ventricles, okay? You see, it is actually extending to the frontal part. This is the frontal part of the brain. So it's extending to this part. So it is called the frontal horn or anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. And then you have here the back part, which is called the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. And this one actually can be seen is inferior. So we usually use these terms like anterior, posterior, inferior sometimes because all all these structures sometimes have to be uh, defined according to the neighboring uh, structures in terms of whether they are found in front or back or on the side. That's why we, you will see that I use these terms very often. And that's it. So we are done with the meninges and the ventricles. And now we can start. Ah, yes, I should also mention this. What is this baby boy he, with this, you know, enlarged head on the top? So when you have a problem with the accumulation, abnormal accumulation of the cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricular system, it, it causes a pressure in the brain tissues, ventricles pushing the pressure, making a pressure, and it causes an enlargement like this. And that is a medical condition called hydrocephalus. And that does not only occur in children, but very often seen in children as a disorder, and also, but can be seen also in the adults as well. Now, these, uh, this is actually, this slide for us is very important because when we want to study the brain structures, their anatomies, we have to have a certain reference point. For example, when you study a map, you have a reference point. When you study the anatomy of the brain, you need references. So, for, for example, you would like to make a section. So you really, if you want to study the brain in the laboratory, uh, you make sections. You fix the tissue, for example, if it is a mouse brain, now you see the human brain, but if it was a mouse brain, uh, you fix 
you fix the tissue that you know it does not get distorted and then you uh, then you it, it is also become very hard as a result of some subsequent procedures then you are able to make very very thin micrometer thick slices of the brain and each slices can be actually studied in the, under the microscope with different staining techniques. And those slices are also very important to study the brain atlas and to compare what you see in the atlas and what you see the, in the microscope and you know, determine the things that you see under the microscope and which stru structures are they. So for that reason, uh, what is here explained as a plane is actually the same procedure that you do when you actually section the tissue brain in the laboratory as well. So one section is actually here you see to divide the whole brain this like this sagittal sagittally. Okay? This is the sagittal plane or sagittal section. Another one is you see is the horizontal section or horizontal plane. Another one is actually you see here is the frontal plane or coronal plane. I sometimes use the term coronal plane, which has the same meaning like frontal plane. Uh, some important terms that I already mentioned, but maybe let's review them. Uh, look at this is, for example, mid-sagittal section of the brain. And there you see this is the ventral side, this is the dorsal side, this is the frontal or anterior side, and this is the posterior or caudal side, and this is sometimes called rostral. If you look at, this is here, the frontal section or coronal section, where you see actually that the, mid, the midline is usually called the medial, uh, but in terms of direction, okay? So if you go from here to here, it is lateral. If you move from here back to here, it is medial direction, medially, okay? Uh, and this is dorsal, this is ventral. Okay, this is a brief summary of the nervous system. So when I talk about the brain, actually brain is not the only nervous system. For humans or animals, you see you have the nervous system, which, is, which has two major divisions, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. And uh, if you look at the central nervous system, actually brain and spinal cord are all belonging to the central nervous system. And in our course, we are only focusing on this part, okay? And the brain, if you see, you have the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, okay? And if you look at the forebrain, actually, you have telencephalon and diencephalon and substructures belonging to each group. And if you look at the midbrain, you see the mesencephalon, a very small area under the forebrain. And if you look at the hindbrain, you have actually metencephalon and myelencephalon. So here I want to emphasize one important thing. Where does this telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, blah, blah, the cephalons are coming from? Any opinion? Have you heard of it before? Okay, uh, this is actually, these are terms deriving from the embryonic developmental stage of the brain. Okay, so because uh, these tissues actually originally originated from the embryonic vesicles, telencephalon, and so different embryonic vesicles give rise to the formation of different brain structures, and that is actually related to that embryonic developmental stage. Because when there is an embryo which is actually formed as a result of the fuse of the sperm with the egg, at first you have three tissues, which is endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Okay, and it is the ectoderm, which is the outermost layer of the uh, embryo from which the skin, but also the nervous tissue is being made, all right? So here you see, for example, a section of the embryo. This is the outermost layer, and where actually there will be this nor neural fold, and eventually a tube like neural tube is being formed like a long tube, and from there, you eventually have actually, which is, the, this is just derived from this in a more differentiated form where you see actually, you know, uh, 
it's already looking like a brain, right? The very mature brain, where you have actually the telencephalon, diencephalon, okay, mesencephalon, metencephalon. So this is very important because this gives us to actually understand the brain structure from the developmental point of view, how different brain structures are actually formed or originated from different tissues or parts of the embryonic brain. And for biologists, it's important because you study their, you know, uh, mechanisms, interactions, how they are being formed. So you, you need to under, find the relations. That's why this is important. But development uh, is extremely important for several reasons, but perhaps for our course of biopsychology, which is more about the behavior, I would like to show a very interesting slide here. So look at the previous slide. This is already in the embryonic stage. But when we are born, this is the brain scan of a child at the age of five, and this is the brain scan of a adult at the age of 20, but what does it mean, adult? Uh, adult is, uh, you know, maybe, what is your definition for adulthood? Maybe depending on the uh, culture and social constructs, it may have a definition, but scientifically or neuroscientifically, it's hard to define that. If you want to define adulthood as a, having a brain, state of the brain, which is like an adult brain, because the development, the develop, Development of the brain does not uh, is not finished until 20, age of 20 or even 25. First of all, it's not uniform. It is not homogeneous for every individual. Okay, so every individual does not follow the same time at the same path. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, there is a huge impact of the environment during development. On one hand, environment is very necessary. Uh, because, uh, you know, the brain, as you see here, the major difference is the frequency of the colors. Here at the age of 20, you see more blue colors, and here you see the red colors. So the increasing blue colors represents the increasing connectivity of the brain. So initially, when we, we are younger, we have a lot of neurons, but their connections, which are provided by axons, remember the axons? So we're not actually completely in, uh, done. It's actually very uh, grossly uh, formed, and it requires further input. Actually, brain during development requires environment as a guide to finally adjust the best connections required for the individual to survive. For that, you, they, uh, for that, the external world and the, all the signals arising from the external world is a guide to finally adjust all these connections. So, so in that case, the environment is required. But there are different environments, there are cultural differences, and all these ha is actually having an impact on the developmental aspects of the brain. So already here until, so adolescence is defined as the stage that you are actually leaving the childhood and developing to become an adult. So it is like a transitional period between childhood and adulthood. So some of you may be already at the end of the adolescence and maybe according to brain development, you are not really adult. And the question is, what happens, especially for the legal uh, issues, that is the question. Uh, do we have to, may adolescents be more reactive in emotional charge and social situations than adults due to changes in refinement of computing brain circuitry because there is a kind of a pressure always. The brain is, you know, build it being built up, you know, connections are refined, and that is like a special developmental stage of the brain. And that makes maybe adolescents more vulnerable to be in the situations with conflicts. So that was already uh, a case that was discussed for the, you know, uh, uh, for the cases of uh, juvenile life without parole, in which, the, uh, you know, adolescents, are they supposed to be sentenced? And if they are supposed to be sentenced as a result of, for example, killing somebody, how long they should be sentenced? Uh, 
So it should be like something like without a parole. So as a result of the recent findings in the in this kind of developmental stage of the brain that actually caused some kind of constitutional change in the Supreme Court in the United States that, you know, in 2005, the death penalty was abolished. In 2010, life without parole for crimes other than homicide was banned. And in 2011, the mandatory life sentences for any crime was abolished. So uh, that was actually an impact of the neuroscientific research. Uh, sometimes I was asked, uh, why is it this way? Or uh, they, sometimes I get questions like some, you know, execution of a uh, adolescence. And they ask me why then this adolescent, maybe his brain is not, you know, developed. First of all, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm just explaining you the current state. Even the judges, they don't have the uniform idea. These are all debates now, what's going on. Okay, so, uh, and then, uh, so uh, we are just, I'm just trying to tell you that there are these cases, uh, uh, it, neuroscience shows us that the adolescent's brain is not actually uh, like an adult brain. So what is then the, how come they can be taken as responsible for their actions if they are not adults? Or even they should, should be responsible is sentencing would be good, like a punishment. Maybe you expect that the punishment would have been, you know, would be a case where actually the individual, you know, learn that if that things happen again, he or she will be punished again. And maybe because of that, he will not do. But there are some research that this, you know, sentencing is, a, is an environment which does not really support the facilitation and development of the brain in the best way possible. And that puts people more risk of actually committing crime in the future. So that's why the, uh, crimes for adolescents is a specific case which should be maybe carefully considered in order to protect the future crimes. How can we use neuroscientific data to facilitate them uh, not to do the same things in the adulthood? Do you think the prison would help them not to do it or is it going to make them even worse? Because, you know, while the brain is developing and then you put them in a more stressful situation in the prison and that will maybe uh, turn them into a monster. I don't know. So I'm not saying this or that, but I'm trying to just inform you that there is such a debate and uh, there are some progress on the side of these decisions uh, in some countries. I don't know how is the case in Russia, but uh, just I want you to tell that, I want you to know that, uh, yeah, adolescent's brain connectivity is not complete until the age of 20, even 25. This is not for one individual, this is a collection of cumulative data of the uh, thousands of uh, brain scans obtained from thousands of uh, adolescents. Okay, so this is like an average value and in individually maybe somebody is already having the adult brain at the age of 19. Some people are not complete yet until the age of 25, for example. So development is so important. Brain development is a whole topic and it's not our topic today. And now we can actually, this is a study I was mentioning, but now we can actually focus on the more anatomical aspects of the brain. So this is the lateral view of the brain. And when we look at it, we have to see the brain in terms of different terms. Because if you read a text about some certain, you know, psychobiological topics, some people would just say forebrain, some people would say diencephalon, some people, so actually basically they want to say the maybe the same thing. Some people just say mesencephalon, while the other would say midbrain. They are not essentially the same. For example, when you say forebrain, you want to say it is both telencephalon and diencephalon. But actually, they can be used interchangeably not to give very specific information about whether it is diencephalon or telencephalon, but some text would just say forebrain. So even to understand some basic text, you need to know these definitions. So in the lateral view, you see the forebrain, which is actually the entire, this, you know, you see this spongy-like structure, which is called the cerebral cortex. And then you see here the diencephalon, 
okay, which is actually the thalamus and hypothalamus, and all together it is called the forebrain, okay? So, and then you have the midbrain, the mesencephalon, and you have the hindbrain. So this is a summary for you later to check when I give you the slides, guys. I wrote it for you. But this is uh, also showing the different structures in the four different, no, uh, five different views of the lateral view, mid, actually mid-sagittal in the lateral side of the brain. If you look at this, this is the lateral view, and this is because there is this cortex, and this structure is actually under the cortex. Okay, this is the cortex here. But here you have actually the sagittal view. The same thing is shown in the sagittal. But now let's study the surface structure. So yes, we have the midbrain, uh, we have the forebrain, we have the hindbrain, but now keep them on the side and let's see what are the features of the basic surface uh, structure of the neuron. Uh, not neuron, the brain, not neuron. <laughs> so here, the top view is called the dorsal view of the brain. If you go to the frontal part, it is called the anterior part, and this part is actually the posterior part. And this is, from the bottom, is the ventral view of the brain. Okay, again, you go on through the anterior part or posterior part, how the anterior and posterior parts are actually very different in the ventral view, right? Well, actually, in the dorsal view, it's also very different uh, according to the functions, but it looks more similar, right, when you compare with the, this one, anterior and posterior. This is the lateral view, so on the side, the lateral view, and this is the anterior part and the posterior part. Okay, anterior part, posterior part. And this is the medial view or sagittal, mid-sagittal view. And again, the anterior part and the posterior part. So let's have a look at now the basic structures. This is, you know, in this slides, these structures are shown in two different uh, levels. For example, in the first one, we show the gross features. In the second slide, we show more detailed structures for the same uh, section or same view of the brain, okay? So you will study this. Now we are going to study the lateral view in two different uh, slides. Each time we are sh showing the same structure but with different traits. These are the gross features of the lateral view. Look at the how it looks on the side and you see that all these, you know, uh, bumps are called gyrus. These are all gyri, the plural. And then you see all these lines. These are all called sulci, salsi, or sulcus, the singular. Sulcus, the singular, salsi is the plural. So the brain is made up of the gyri and the salsi in the cortical area. The whole area here is called cerebral cortex. And one of the most important characteristics of the cerebral cortex is these, you know, gyrus and sulcus, or gyri and salsi. So one significance uh, regarding this, you know, structure of like this gyri and salsi is the fact that because if it is not, if it, it has, it increases the surface area of the brain, which actually leads the, leads the brain having more cells with a smaller volume area. So that is the reason why the brain is like having this wrinkled structure. And then here you see a very typical structure, which is called cerebellum. So this is cerebral cortex. And sometimes we call this cerebellar cortex. Cerebral cortex and cerebellar cortex. So very similar. Both of them have their own cortex, cortices, which are different. So don't mix the cerebral cortex and cerebellar cortex. And then here you have this little structure just in the, you know, uh, inferior part of the frontal part of the brain, and that is called the olfactory bulb, which is involved in the sense of smell. Okay? Olfaction, 
is actually smell, sense of smell. And then you have the brain stem. So here you see the brain lobes now, because these lobes are actually divided based on their functions. If you can see here, uh, we have the frontal part, clear, right? The frontal part of the brain is the frontal lobe or frontal cortex. And then you have here the parietal lobe or parietal co cortex. At the very posterior part is the occipital lobe, okay? Uh, which is important for the vision. And then here you have uh, in the lateral part is the temporal cortex or temporal lobe and the cerebellum. And if you actually pull apart the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, you're gonna see actually another area called the insula. So, all these gyri and salsi have their names, but we are not going to learn each of them one by one. But at least we should be able to know just a few landmarks in order to, you know, uh, sometimes we need to locate certain structures. And these landmarks are also very important because they are the borders of different lobes. Here you see the central sulcus here. Central sulcus is a sulcus that separates the frontal cortex from the parietal lobe or parietal cortex, okay? So, and the first gyrus in the anterior part of the central sulcus is called the precentral gyrus. And the gyrus posterior to the central sulcus, the first gyrus at the, after the central sulcus, I usually call it like the gyrus posterior to the central sulcus, which is shown with this uh, yellowish green is called the postcentral gyrus. Precentral gyrus is important for voluntary movement. And it's such a place that a lot of experiments were done in this area. For example, they introduced some electrodes uh, into this area in the animals. And then depending on the area of uh, stimulation, the related uh, body part was moving as a result of the electrical stimulation. So these experiments gave a lot of uh, insights into the motor coordinate, motor movement, motor uh, attributes of the motor uh, skills. And then here you have, the, as I said, the postcentral gyrus, which is important for somatosensation. Somatosensation is actually the neuroscientific term uh, that we want to explain the sense of Touch, touch, okay? So you touch somewhere, but touch is not just touch. So we, when we touch something, we feel whether it is cold, or so we feel the temperature, we feel whether, the, uh, whether, the, whether where, we, where we touch is smooth or not, okay, soft or not. So it's very complex thing, and one brain area that is Im important for this sensation of touch is the postcentral gyrus, and it is called primary somatosensory cortex, because uh, you know, uh, the brain information processing is not like occurring, oh, we have the motor cortex here, and then the all things related to motor, uh, move, motor actions is done with that area. No, there is a lot of, you know, our environment and how we interact with our environment is unified. And so that means that all the information that we get and respond to the environment should be, you know, in a unified way. So all these different primary areas then associated in the association areas of the cortex. That's why one area is not only enough to interact for us. And then here, another uh, actually sulcus. This is a sulcus, but when a sulcus is actually deeper than uh, any other sulcus, we sometimes call them as fissure. So the sulcus is a sulcus which is a little deeper. And this is called lateral fissure or lateral or cilian fissure, which separates the frontal cortex from the temporal cortex or temporal lobe. So we learned two important landmarks in order to actually separate the brain lobes. The first one is the central sulcus, which separates the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. The second one is the lateral uh, fissure, which separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. Okay.
Okay, uh, actually, I already talked about uh, that this is, for example, the primary cortical area, the precentral gyrus, and I also said this is a somatosensory cortex, uh, the uh, postcentral gyrus, but I don't want you to really know all these numbers in detail, but what I want you to focus is, you see, these are the primary motor and somatosensory areas, but as you see with the purple col color, we chose the association areas that, you know, process all the information that is taken from the primary sensory areas. Okay, so we have the primary areas and we have the association areas. And here, based on the color, you can see and differentiate them. Now we can start the structures in the mid-sagittal section. So this is again the mid-sagittal section, although we cut it, still we review as surface feature. And here you can see in the lateral surface, there are actually many, many different structures. Then sometimes you need to look at the three different forms of the same uh, section. Let's start with the first one. So here you see here the actually the one in the top is actually just the medial side of the frontal cortex. We have the frontal cortex here and this is like folded into the into the cerebral hemisphere, one side of the cerebral hemisphere, and you see that that is called the medial side of the frontal cortex. And just underneath, you see another gyrus shown as blue, called as cingulate gyrus. And after that, you see here corpus callosum. You know what corpus callosum is? Maybe you heard it before, it's a very famous term. But in terms of maybe neurons, you have to remember that we have axons. The neurons have axons, and corpus callosum are just very long bundles of axons that connect the two hemispheres with each other. But they are so thick and big, and actually they are just the bundles of axons. And uh, because axons are fatty due to the, their specific structures, that are, they are encapsulated by myelin sheet. These are the specific cells that have more fat and that causes them actually look white, white. So that's why axonal fibers are sometimes called as uh, white matter. So if I say white matter, you have to understand that it is the fibers or axon bundles of axons that are actually connecting one area of the brain to the other. These could be connection between the one side of the hemisphere, or it could be the connection between the two sides of the hemisphere, depending on the axonal bundles and their directions. So corpus callosum is just one of those bundles. So an important white matter structure, which are the bundles of axons that connect two hemispheres. And this is a fornix. Fornix is again like an output circuitry that is actually providing the main output from the uh, important brain structure called hippocampus, which actually you will see here now. Because you see in this view, when you really make a mid-sagittal section, you cannot see the hippocampus. So for that, you, we need to actually look at it from this view, where you see actually two different structures. This is called the amygdala and hippocampus, which is found in the beneath of the overlying cortex. And amygdala and hippocampus are important structures belonging to the a uh, system called limbic system, which we will see later, but the limbic system is important for biopsychology topics such as motivation, emotion, and memory, okay? But uh, limbic system has other structures, not only uh, amygdala and hippocampus. So these are the bra four brain structures when you look at them in the mid-sagittal mid section. Uh, now, when you look at the brainstem structures, so we have the four brain structures that are visible in the mid-sagittal section, but we also have brainstem structures, again, in the same section, okay? Here you see the thalamus, 
It's like in the center, and the thalamus is, uh, you know, sometimes I think like its importance, especially for popular science, is highly ignored. I mean, it's like a central relay station. Like, you know, a lot of different uh, sensory modalities or information coming from the sensory neurons are first coming to the thalamus. And thalamus is supposed to sort them out and send to the relevant brain regions in the cortical area. So it's like a relay station, like a central place to deliver the right signals into the right part in the cortex. So that's why thalamus and thalamocortical connections are very essential for, you know, fundamental brain function. And then you see just adjacent to the thalamus, you see the hypothalamus, all right? And uh, actually hypothalamus is like, is very important for homeostasis. What is homeostasis? I was mentioning before. It's a very important concept for the survival of an organism. It's essential to provide the organism an, a, 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 you know, internally constant environment, a constant internal environment, which is required for the optimal physiological functioning of the organism. And that is actually in the systemic level is controlled by hypothalamus. All essential hormones are uh, mediated or uh, managed by the hypothalamic secretions. And then you have the midbrain structures, tectum and tegmentum, and then you have actually the hindbrain pons and medulla as well. And then here you have the cerebrum. And the ventricles, we already covered the ventricles, but how does, how do these ventricles are, uh, how, how, how are these ventricles seen when we have the uh, lateral view? Here you are going to see, for example, the third ventricle, all right? The third ventricle, which is actually uh, overlapping with Thalamus. So I don't know. So if you have a, a lateral view of the brain, which one is going to be seen? Is it depending if you Google tonight, uh, maybe go at home and write the lateral view of the brain in the mid sagittal, mid -sagittal section of the brain. And which one is actually shown? Is it shown with the, with the existence of uh, ventricles or without ventricles? Is the thalamus is visible or not? But actually, you know, there are two thalamic thalami in each hemisphere, and central uh, third ventricle is found in between them, okay? So th that's why in the lateral view, actually you have the thalamus, but all, then that means this is a hemisphere, that means on the other side you have the same structure symmetrically, but there is in between here, at least this part, there is the third ventricle which is found at the both uh, in the middle of two thalami, thalami, all right? And look at the lateral ventricle here now. This is like a little shown as transparent because uh, of its 3D structure, it's not uniform. So that's why it is, it's a little complicated. But you see here, for example, the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, which you may think that it is actually aligning with the hippocampus. And this is the ventral surface of the brain. In the ventral surface, you see it is not uh, as homogeneous as the, for example, dorsal view, as I already said. And uh, you see the olfactory bulbs. As I said, everything is like we have two hemispheres and everything is symmetrical, at least when you have a gross view. But in detail, there could be some uh, uh, non-symmetrical features. And this is the optic nerve. There are, you see how the hypothalamus is visible when you look at from the ventral side. These are the pons, this is the cerebellum when you have the ventral side. These are different nerve uh, fibers, which is actually not very essential for our topics. That's why I do not want to pay too much time on that. But all I want you to know that you see how the ventral surface is very different than the dorsal surface, and probably you would expect that these structures are connecting to the brain, to the spinal cord, and that allows for the whole body to be interacting with the brain. <laughs> 
And I think I didn't cover the dorsal view, right? So look at, this is the left hemisphere, and this is the right hemisphere, all right? And there is this here, you see? Do you see this fissure, or it, is it like, a, I told you that very, very deep sulcus is a fissure, and this is the longitudinal fissure that separates the left and right hemisphere. And what you see, what you are going to see if you just, you know, pull away these two hemispheres is the corpus callosum in the dorsal view of the brain. So you see the corpus callosum in the mid-sagittal view, as you remember, right? And you can also see the corpus callosum in the dorsal view if you pull away the two hemispheres physically. And this is the cerebellum, okay? And cerebellum is also like have the left, uh, left cerebellum, left cerebral, cerebellar hemisphere, and right cerebellar hemisphere. And left and uh, in, the, in between the left and right, there is this structure called vermis. Cerebellum is very important for, uh, you know, motor learning, learning of skills, coordination, balance, and also maybe, uh, you know, some, there were some experiments. Do you remember we were talking about HM, uh, that he was able to remember, he was not able to remember after the surgery of the medial temporal area, removal of the medial temporal lobe. So, but he was able to learn something, some skills after the surgery. He was not able to remember names, people, faces, and, but he was able to learn some skills and probably because that then gave the idea that there are different forms of memories that are mediated by different structures. Otherwise, how come if the medial temporal lobe bilaterally is removed and only certain forms of things are not memorized while others can be memorized and maybe some of the things are mediated by cerebellum, for example, which was not distorted during the surgery of the HM. And these are actually, here you see, look at the two thalamus here, okay? And then you have the midbrain structures and the pons and you have some other structures. When you open, you see here the fourth ventricle. Do you remember the fourth? The third ventricle is actually connected to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, which has the cerebral spinal fluid. And then it goes through the spinal cord via this way, by the fourth ventricle. And uh, so, so far, what we learn we learned the ventricular system, and we learned the surface view of the brain from the dorsal, ventral, very briefly with the ventral, but especially with the dorsal and lateral and mid-sagittal views. And now we are gonna learn actually, especially I will focus on the first, the second, and the third one here in, this, in the scope of this class. And these are the actually cross-sectional view of the brain from these different sides. As you see, it's not homogeneous. And because of that, uh, each uh, way of section will give a different uh, kind of structure to be visible. And we need to know that. What is this number one and two and three? And which kind of structures are visible? So this is the first cross-section one, which is this one. Okay, which can be seen as the forebrain and thalamus telencephalon junction. Remember the forebrain, which is made up of diencephalon and uh, <coughs> telencephalon. So the forebrain, when you cut, you look at here, this is the telencephalon and you, this is the thalamus, the start of the thalamus, so you just cut before coming to the thalamus. So in the beginning of the thalamus, you cut and you look at the section, what you see. And uh, here you see, the first thing you see is actually, the first thing you have to understand that this is symmetrical. Although in this figure, this looks with different color because it assumes that you already know it is symmetrical, but just to make it understand easily, they show only one part, 
but you have to assume that what you see on part, one part is actually the same in the other part. For example, this is the frontal lobe, frontal lobe, okay? Frontal lobe here, the frontal lobe. This is the frontal lobe, and this is also the frontal lobe. So everything here is actually the frontal cortex, okay? And then here you see the insula, Remember, which is actually when you remove, when you pull away the frontal lobe and here the temporal lobe. And then you can see the insula, but of course you don't pull away and in the section this is the insula and you see here the temporal lobe here and you see here also the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe, okay? Look at the lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles are there. To me, I think it is very important to understand the structure of the lateral ventricles and then you put them everything around because they are always appearing from everywhere. <laughs> so it's confusing if you don't know what is a ventricle and how it is actually the, located, the ventricular system. So this is the lateral ventricle and then here you see the thalamus and then that means the thalamus. There is also thalamus here, okay? And then there is hypothalamus, hypothalamus, all right? And here, for example, you see these structures we call as basal forebrain. These are the groups of nuclei. So, you know, when I say nucleus in the context of a cell, you have to understand that it is an organelle or a structure that is containing DNA and found in the neuron cell body. That is the nucleus in the context of neuron. But when we talk about neuroanatomy or anatomy, nucleus doesn't mean that. So nucleus has another meaning and you should be able to differentiate that. When I say nuclei, that means the group of cell bodies of neurons. That means we, I am not talking about one neuron. I am talking about the group of neurons and their cell bodies all together located like a cluster. Because for anatomical terms, it is important to understand that you know there are neurons and their connections are going somewhere. Gray matter, white matter. So the gray matter is actually uh, corresponding to the, these nuclei gray matter, and the white matter is the axons and their bundles. So for anatomical terms, that's why if you see, for example, the basal forebrain, that means there are some groups of nuclei, the cell bodies of the neurons all together connected. So we are not talking one neuron and its anatomy, we're talking more structural location of the group of neurons all together, their cell bodies. And their axons are probably connecting and going somewhere else, and we want to make that separation. Okay, so this is a basal forebrain for such group of different nuclei. And then here you see the sylvian fissure, and I think, yeah, the third ventricle. Lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. You see how the third ventricle is in between the two uh, thalami, as I already said. And now let's have a look at the fiber groups. Fiber groups are all about white matter, the axons. So again, the same structure, but now we are going to focus on the fiber groups. So here you see again the, you know, uh, forebrain in the telencephalon tel uh, and thalamus junction, but now the same structure will be studied or examined in terms of the white matter fibers. So look at that, look at the corpus callosum, okay? The white matter tract, all right? And of course, you have also uh, globus pallidus putamen. They are not shown as white because these are nuclei, cell bodies, group of nuclei that are, you know, located as neuronal cell bodies. And this is the caudate nucleus, another actually group of nuclei of cell bodies, group of cell bodies, which are the nuclei, sorry. All right. And then there is another structure called internal capsule. These are all, all these actually different 
white, grayish uh, fiber-like drawings are corresponding to cortical white matter. These are basically the long axonal tracks. Connection, it's all about connection and interaction. So white matter is actually corresponding to the axon fibers. And now we come to the second uh, section, the cross section two. And that is now you make a cross section just in the mid section of the thalamus, in the mid part of the thalamus, like this. Okay? And then, of course, uh, then what we see is slightly different then. Look at here, and now look at the ventricles and how the ventricles are now. <laughs> So the same ventricles looking so differently, right? Do you remember the dorsal view of the ventricles? They have such like horns, but very strange kind of horns. And of course, if you make them their sections, they will look very differently depending on the section. So in this second section where you cut it just in the midline from the thalamus coronally, you're gonna have the lateral ventricles filled with cerebrospinal fluid at this shape the lateral ventricles. And then look at the thalamus here, okay? The insula is here. You see, now the frontal lobe is not seen anymore. This is the parietal lobe. So you remember there is the central sulcus which separates the frontal lobe with the parietal lobe. And then when you cut from the thalamus in the midline, then you are now arriving to the borders for parietal cortex, so that's why this is all here is the cortical area that is belonging to parietal lobe, okay? And then the lateral fissure. And then look at the third ventricle now, how the third ventricle became so tiny, all right? And here, the hypothalamus. So thalamus and hypothalamus are adjacent to each other. And you see, this is the, still the temporal lobe. So on the side, it is like all temporal lobe, but on the dorsal view, it starts with the frontal cortical area, and then it continues with the parietal cortical area, and then in the back, it goes through the occipital lobe. Oops. Now, look at certain, uh, sorry for this, it has to be here. I hope it doesn't uh, block your vision. The citation, this is our textbook. So here, look at the different nuclei, caudate nuclei, for example, internal capsule, these are the white matter area, and then here, again, you have the cortical white matter area, okay? For example, here you see the temporal lobe, as I already said, and then this is the gray matter of the temporal cortex, and then from there, there are all these axonal fibers, which are the white matter area, Look at the corpus callosum, the famous cortical uh, tract, white matter tract that combines the two hemispheres, and then the cerebral cortex. It says cerebral cortex because why in the previous slide it already showed that it is actually the cortex belonging to the parietal lobe. Okay? And then, yeah, all these different nuclei, this is globus pallidus. Okay, I, for example, I don't want you to know, believe me, these are just the very famous ones, so we didn't go very detailed. Maybe it's, it's, it, it sounds to you like too much, but actually these are just very basic landmarks. And I even, uh, you are going to hear globus pallidus ptamen a lot, substantia nigra maybe a lot sometimes. That's why at least you should know that these are the nuclei that are found in the coronal, under the subcortical area of the brain in the coronal sections. You can see them. At least you should know that they are not located in the cortex. Okay. Now we come to the point three. Point three. And... Uh, and that is like, first, we see the gross features. In the gross features, what we are going to see, of course, the ventricles again. Look at the lateral ventricles. They are now a little bigger. Okay, this is in the forebrain at the thalamus midbrain junction. So now it goes 
through the back to the posterior to the thalamus and starting with the midbrain junction and where you see actually two uh, lateral ventricles at two sides. And then, of course, this is the cortical area shown as green belonging to the parietal lobe. Bilaterally. Bilaterally means in the both sides. And then here, look at the thalamus. And now, this is here. Can you see this? This is the lateral ventricle, but this is the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Remember, it's like, like a C-shaped structure. And at this section, you can see the inferior horn as well here. And actually, this is again aligning very closely with this structure called hippocampus. And this is actually hippocampus. It will be shown in the other slide, but I'm already telling you how the lateral ventricles in the inferior horn is aligned with the hippocampus. So this was the area which was removed in the patient HM, bilaterally. And uh, look at the cerebral aqueduct that connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle here. And then these are the midbrain structures. This is the temporal lobe. Okay, this is how our brain slice works at this angle. Now let's have a look at some detailed selected structures. Look at the hippocampus. All right, and then actually, where is the where is the lateral ventricle in the inferior horn is located just here. It's aligned with the hippocampus. So, and then yeah, look at the corpus callosum, and these are all cortical white matter. So I'm not mentioning all other nuclei, but I want you to know that there are nuclei in the subcortical areas, and there are also uh, white matter areas. At least if you see something with a suffix nucleus or nuclei, you are going to understand that these are the group of cell bodies of neurons doing a specific function located uh, there. And the others are the white matter fibers. Now, Actually, I want to, now we are done actually with all the sections. So I am not going to describe the rest of the sections. I just want to focus very basics, just because our main focus in our class is to understand the behavioral correlations of the brain function. So and I think this level of information is enough in terms of sections and uh, surface uh, features. But I want you to know also how, for example, uh, the diencephalon, which are the parts of the forebrain, are seen in the 3D view. Look at, the, for example, here, uh, look at, this is the thalamus. So I said thalamus, there are two thalami at each hemisphere. And this is the left thalamus, this is the right thalamus, and hypothalamus is in front. You see the cerebellum, you see the mesencephalon, okay? Now, I want to actually have a look at I want you to look based on those previous structures. Now I have added something else on top of them, which are shown with the color. And you have to see the cingulate cortex here, which was visible already very well in the mid-sagittal section, the cingulate cortex. But actually in the 3D section, it looks like this with this green color. And look at the hippocampus, how differently it looks in the coronal section and how it looks with the 3D view. And you see here, and here the ventricles are not seen because you have to remove certain structures in order to see some of them clearly. Here we are showing the structures that are especially important for motivation, learning, and memory. Okay, and uh, that's why I want you to give a special emphasis on that where you see here the left and right cingulate cortex and the hippocampus and amygdala, all right? Another important system I would like you to know is the basal ganglia. Again, each time, remember uh, thalamus as a, as a reference and how each structure is located according to thalami at each hemisphere. So this was the limbic system and now I'm going to talk about uh, 
the basal ganglia, which is more important for, uh, for example, it was involved in the pathophysiology of diseases like Parkinson disease, which is important, which is, uh, which has some disorder for movement. And uh, here you see this structure here, like very uh, unique shape with the purple color. This is the caudate, this is the globus pallidus, and here you see actually the amygdala, which is very close in proximity with these structures. And uh, there, are, there is also here the structure called nucleus accumbens. This is also important for several uh, mechanisms involved in pleasure and reward. So I may, we may need to know where is it located, all right? And they are all in the very close proximity with the thalami at each hemisphere. And actually, this is just for you to see that the brain is actually the forebrain. The cortex are sitting just, you know, coming from the brain stem and the thalami, and then and the next rest is constructed on top of them. But such a unique feature. Okay. And uh, here, just for you as a general overview, let's make a final summary. We already covered the majority of the topics. Just I want you to be aware that uh, here, you see here the lateral view, and you make a section, and you look at the coronal view, how you see actually now the longitudinal fissure, longitudinal fissure here, the lateral ventricles, the corpus callosum, the sylvian fissure or red lateral fissure on each side, of course. Look at the hippocampus, all right? The thalamus and the third ventricle. If you see the third ventricle, you have to think that the thalami at each side of the third ventricle. It doesn't matter if they don't show it. And uh, now, this is a great picture or slide that shows the same structures in two different view. And for example, this is the lateral view and this is the dorsal view. And how in the lateral view, you have to think that this is the frontal lobe, but it is actually found in the bilateral in both hemispheres. So how you see actually the frontal lobe and this is actually here, the central sulcus that separates the frontal lobe with the parietal lobe, which is here, here on the lateral view, okay? And then you see on the dorsal view, you are not able to see the temporal cortex. And the occipital lobe is in the posterior part. And here actually in the lateral view, how you can see all these sections or parts of the lobes of the brain. Okay, I think this is the summary of all, a very much detailed one, but I think I may not, uh, we can review that in the other seminars later. I think that is enough for today. Thank you for coming. <laughs>